sister location, when it first came out, the day before it was slated to come out, there was security breach, and then you loaded it, and it said mature version. And we're like, oh, they would... I, I think, here, I think... I think we actually have a GT Live clip of this. Sister location mature. Is this what you saw already? Or is no, this, this okay. is a new post. Okay, okay. so we'll, we'll read it. We'll read it just so everybody has it. <gasps> is, oh, um, man, look at yeah. baby Sister man. Sister location MA. MA, yeah. Hold on. Look at your face. I know, I was so confused. Like, this is a, this is huge, man. Oh, was it troll? <laughs> I was so time? mad. Oh, we got trolled. Are you kidding me? This is the equivalent it's of getting so, trolled on the internet. Are you kidding me? It was so good. It Damn was so it. Good. it. The chat was so I was floored. And welcome to GT Not Live, where we're not live and we're talking about FNAF. <laughs> uh, but we will be live soon. And uh, this is the first thing that I should call out at the top of today's episode, is the fact that for those of you who missed it, we recently did a Five Nights at Freddy's, like our third security breach theory in our uh, tetralogy. We, uh, it, I originally envisioned it being four of them, uh, or I envisioned, originally thought it would take like three of them to wrap up all of security breach but then it ended up getting extended a bit. So we have four episodes uh, of Game Theory all about Security Breach. The fourth one is coming out on February 19th. Don't know the time yet. We're still working on figuring that one out. But uh, we're going to release that one live. And then like an hour after we set that video live, we're gonna have a live theorist talk back with uh, me, some members of Team Theorist who have stuff that they want to get off their chest as it relates to Security Breach, uh, as well as other FNAF theorists from around YouTube uh, to be a part of that discussion, to talk all things Security Breach, all things theoretical, uh, how this new game plays into what came before, and just like, you know, a jam session about FNAF. Uh, so if there is anyone that you want us to reach out to, uh, and anyone that you think would be a good idea to like be a, as a part of this stream, let us know. I know that actually the FNAF theorist uh, ecosystem has changed a lot. The very first GT Live, first, first, first one ever, was the exact same thing way, way back in the day when FNAF 4 had launched, right? And it was me and Alex on the couch, who was a, who was a writer for us at the time, uh, as well as like Rezbowski and 8-Bit and uh, Docco and uh, Smike. Crazy to think about that at the time, and since then a lot of the the it, a lot of it has changed, right? There are new FNAF theorists that have come. Some have pivoted away from theorizing things like that. So, if there is anyone that you personally would like to see as a part of that live stream, and you think like, hey, this is someone who would have some good thoughts or interesting contributions to make, uh, let us know. We'll try to make it work. We're in the process of reaching out to people right now. Um, and you know, that's one of the reasons why we haven't announced a time. We want to find a time that works best for everyone's schedule because we're asking them to do this on a Saturday and stuff so we'll see but anyway that is February 19th uh live so it's our final FNAF final FNAF security breach theory uh, until of course like some extra lore drops or DLC or whatever and then uh immediately following that uh we're gonna do a live kind of like director's commentary talk back plus a conversation with uh, some theorists so spend uh in like two two hours or so with us on a Saturday to talk FNAFs, share your theories, and just hang out on the couch and talk about this new game. Right? That, that sounds about right. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? You Th nailed that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, so, with that being said now, uh, so, all, all the security breach stuff aside, I, we're back to the iceberg, apparently, uh, because when Matt chose this, he chose the thing with the most words, which meant that we we're going to be sitting on this couch talking for a year about... At this point, what? This is month three of yeah. us covering this? Yeah. We have spanned three months. This is our longest series by far. <laughs> it's, no, it's not. It's, it hasn't beaten Security Breach yet. That's true. We need to get over 15 uploads out of this I, thing for it to beat se could. Security Breach. I really think we could. I don't know. Okay, wait. Where are we at? Look, no, I, I scrolled down and it didn't take me that long to scroll to the end. Because we left off at Puppet, right? Yeah. So, look... Two, two, three, four, five. Like, we're but close. you forget the further down the the iceberg we go, the less stuff you know, and the more we have to Google. That is true. It, it does slow us down mm -hmm. a lot. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, this has been a series that we've been going on where, in anticipation for the release of Security Breach, <laughs> I wonder how the game's going to be. Uh-oh, I'm so excited. Can't wait for it to drop. 
Uh, <laughs> in, anticipation, in anticipation for us uh, waiting for a security breach to come out, we started this FNAF iceberg to test not only my knowledge, but to educate Matt about it, educate you guys about it, and also uh, to expose me to a lot of stuff that I uh, wasn't familiar with too, because this was, at the time, kind of like the longest, most robust iceberg that uh, Matt could find. And what we've seen is that it touches on, like, the, the assumed knowledge here is actually very different, right? This one is very much uh, in, in the weeds of, like, the development process and even, like, some of the fan community as opposed to, like, the lore and stuff. And so for me, obviously, lore, uh, I'll be able to, to recite that, you know, and, and weird Easter eggs and details and stuff like that for the most part. Cut content, I get a little bit weaker uh, when it comes to, like promotional cycles and stuff I'm pretty good with. Uh, obviously the books and, and things I'm super familiar with. Uh, but when it comes to outside of that, uh, you know, with the fan community, I know some of the fan games obviously, uh, you know, and, and, and some of like the conversations and stuff. But, uh, you know, the broader and broader we get away from the main games, that's where I get weaker and weaker. And so this has been a really good uh, educational process for me as, as well as just a good refresher of everything. So now we're into the part where I think, I think I get, you know, like Matt said, we're going to have to Google more of this stuff. And so we're all going to learn something here today. So if I'm correct, actually, Matt's telling me, so you, you looked it up, we left off at the puppet? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what do we got? Uh, okay. So first off, blurred newspaper text. This one isn't hard. Um, and again, this is, I think, one of those times that shows why my like I would never consider this this deep into an iceberg because this is pretty obvious to me so the blurred newspaper text is what happens in pretty much every game at this point uh it's become pretty standard to the point that security breach even jokes on it they meme on it uh but when you look at I believe it started in FNAF 3 is it it's FNAF 3 when it started um yeah let's just pull it up was it in, was it in one? Uh, the sad, yeah, because basically what it ultimately amounts to is in each of the endings, there is text around the main art. Like you usually see a newspaper at some point, right? And then what ends up happening is there is text around the main article that you're supposed to be focusing on that is making a joke or saying like, this isn't important or whatever it is. So, uh... Let's see if we can just find some of these. So like for instance, yeah, like if you actually, yeah, so in FNAF 3, that's the one that I always think of when I think about it, is you have stories uh, by Scott where he just kind of like gives you extra information about stuff, um, where he's talking about like, I actually modeled a foxy character on my laptop while riding on a 14 hour drive to visit my in-laws. Uh, it, it was a cool Easter egg, right? Because none of it was intrinsic to the lore. Like, it wasn't actually solving anything about the games. It was very clearly just, like, director's commentary almost from Scott. But it was, like, these little added, like, fun facts for anyone who bothered to look at these, spend time reading them, unblur them, whatever. Um, and even you see some stuff from the iceberg. And while working on the first game, I started a crowdfunding campaign for it. I raised exactly zero dollars. Before I began working on FNAF, I had to choose what game to make out of three potential games. Knowing it bite me my last try before having to start a new career, I was choosing between a sequel to Desolate Hope, a remake of my first game, Legacy of Flan, or a new idea about animatronics and security cameras. So, like, uh, I don't, I, I don't, is this the official one? I don't think this is the official one. And again, like, this is one of those things where you just have to, you know, double check and, like, triple check that your sources are okay. But, like, here, you can see, like, blah, 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 this, this ad doesn't mean anything, blah. Class. But but that's what this is a reference to is all the blurred newspaper text around all of this stuff and each one has its own little fun thing and, and the community's kind of memed on it and stuff like that. But in Security Breach, when you get to the endings, uh, oh, Security Breach, FNAF. <laughs> I forgot, Security Breach is an actual thing that people care about. But this one uh, very clearly, I believe it was this one, right? says like blah 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 this has nothing to do with lore blah 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 you know this is not important to this storyline so you know again it's it's one of those things that is just expected as a part of these games now that the the text along the sides is telling you it's at least like a fun little easter egg i do miss the the days where it was scott like dropping in like little behind the scenes things i thought that was a really cool 
fun way of incorporating that. And so the fact that now it's just more like, lol, this isn't actually a thing. I'd love it if they went back to that idea of just, here's little lore bits. That's fun. I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Were you the era of the newspaper? Was I the era of the newspaper? Like, like were I, 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 <laughs> Matt, newspapers have been communicating information to the masses for more than just an era. Were you around when newspapers... Well, I remember the paper boy on the corner saying, he, 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 he. That's exactly what I'm asking. Yeah? Yeah. But... How old do you think I am? <laughs> like, like, we're, like... <laughs> my little page boy, was I a newsie back in the day? Well, because I have really early memories of The king my, of New York. Of my parents reading newspapers. Yeah. But, like, by the time I was, like, five, newspapers were obsolete. Sure, yeah. Um, no, my, I mean, my dad read newspapers all throughout my childhood. Uh, yeah. Like, we got the daily newspaper. Uh-huh. And... My and and I would not read it, but I, he would always leave out the comment. I, I mm. my morning routine every morning before I went to school yeah. was I would read the comics. I would you know if there was time I would maybe do like the jumble or like the crossword or what like the, the little word games that mm. they include in there. And then usually it'd be time to go to school. Mm. And so like as I was eating my cereal, I would just like do that thing. And my dad knew to like leave it out, right? Um, That's and, sweet. And yeah, and still to this and and still to this very day. Once a year, our local newspaper, The Plain Dealer, in Cleveland at least, um, at the end of the year and at the top of the next year, they do a massive, a massive, massive crossword that is literally two pages wide, uh, 600 plus clues. It's not hard. Yeah. It's just, it's like a year recap crossword. And it's really fun. Um, and so Steph and I will do it and my dad will save it for us so that we can do it. And then the next week he'll give us the answer key if we need it. But, you know. That's so nice. Yeah, it's, it's, That's it, so pleasant. Yeah, it's, it's cool. And so yeah. it's like a yearly tradition for us at this point. Um, but no, I think if you're talking about like the era of newspapers mm-hmm. and like hardcore reading of newspapers, it was probably like the generation before my parents. Like my mm-hmm. grandparents were probably like in the thick of mm. newspapering. Yeah. And my parent and I think like that those two generations were really big into that. Yeah. Cuz like the I'm trying to think like the William Randolph Hearsts and stuff of the world was like what? 19 20 Cuz that was all you're also talking like World War 1 era like Yeah, it's interesting 20s to me that, 40s like, FNAF relies so heavily on newspapers. It is interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Well, but also FNAF I mean it's not that old, but it's also like this, a lot of the eighties, right? Well, right. FNAF is taking place in a lot, or at least most of them, up till newer entries, right? Is like, you know, yeah, eighties, nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, I think FNAF three, like you're right, FNAF three, which is I, I I believe takes place in like twenty twenty something or other. Like that one feels oddly out mm-hmm. of date now, mm-hmm. where it's like there's a newspaper at the end. And it's like no, there wouldn't be, you know, yeah. or maybe there would be, and but it's 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 out of date. What would it be instead? Like a tweet. Tablet comes out, right? I mean, it could be. It could be a tweet. It could, like, oh, burn down. <laughs> like, it's hard. It's hard to do hidden blurred text on the sides if it's just a tweet. Um, a cool. BuzzFeed article. BuzzFeed article. Yeah, that's, I, honestly, that's what it is. A Snapchat story. <laughs> it's, yeah, that's what it is. Oh, that's a YouTuber's comment. Today, Pizzeria, it, it, Phil, it's, a Phil, it's an episode of Phil DeFranco show. <laughs> Sup, punch me in the throat <laughs> if you want to like my video or Is whatever. That what he says? Yeah, his uh, he learned that by telling people to uh like this video or I will punch you in the throat. Uh, that's pretty uh good. that it it increased the analytics. Uh it increased the number of clicks on like because this is a different episode. I like that we've done one, man. You're, you're really angling for that 15, 15 mark uh, upload. But uh, no, this is something that we talk about in our consulting a bunch all the time, which is everyone is so desensitized to like, like, comment, and subscribe. First, yeah. that's the worst thing. You, you call for one thing. Subscribe. Watch another video. Like this video. Don't, but you know, whatever. I, I mean, you should like this video, but when it comes to things that are most beneficial for your channel, getting them to watch another video after yours is like the best thing. Hmm. Uh, but... Uh, because people are so desensitized to this stuff, doing things that catch people's attention yeah. is what is most effective. Yeah. Lick that subscribe button, mm. bite of 87, that like button or whatever, you know? And so mm. for Phil, he was just experimenting, I think one day and he's like, uh, if you don't do this, I'll punch you in the throat. And he saw like this huge huh. uptick in t- number of likes. Yeah. And as a result, he's made it into a thing, which I think at this point now has probably reduced the effectiveness of it. Mm. But you always have to be kind of like changing it up. We should come up with one. Yeah. Punch me in the 
<laughs> Nards. Liked or I'll force you to read all the this... Fazbear Friday yeah. books. <laughs> yeah, make sure you like this video or you will have to read every single Fazbear Frights. And that is 12 books plus a 13th non-canonical book hitting store shelves soon. So, trust me, you don't want to do it. <laughs> Actually, no, I, I'd rather read the Faz I'd rather read 12 Fazbear Frights books than the original novel trilogy. So. <laughs> so like this video or I will sit you down on this couch and you will be forced to read the original novel trilogy. There you go. That's it. We'll see you. And now you can measure the analytics and see how it affects yeah, things. Okay, there you go. Cool. Great. So we got through one. <laughs> uh, unused puppet frame. I'm assuming that this is this, which is, I'm assuming, also a thing from FNAF 2. Uh, where, you know, it, it was cut from the final game. Here, unused puppet, unused puppet. Okay, I like that this is auto-filling in. Uh, unused and removed content. Uh, we looked at this before. Puppets close-up? Puppet close-up. Oh, okay, okay, here we go. Yes. Uh, there's an unused image of the puppet's close-up resembling the last frame of its jump scare, only closer and lacking white pupils. All right, I have nothing much to say about that one. Uh, canceled theme park ride. Oh, okay. So, okay, some of these I do know. Uh, canceled theme park. <sighs> because I try to pay attention to every stupid corner of the lore, and I was interested in this one, I believe FNAF was presented at a... Uh, I, I, I learned a lot, actually. <laughs> Whether I remember a lot is a thing. But I learned a lot when I saw this. It is, there was a big amusement park ride convention, right? Like, all the people who make amusement park rides. If I recall correctly, they got together for, like, some convention or whatever where they, like, like a, uh, what do you call it? A, uh, an industry event. That's the word. Like, an industry event where everyone from, like, the parks creation uh, thing got together. And, you know, they were presenting new ideas or upcoming projects that they were working on or whatever. And I believe that one of them, and this really caught me off guard and I was really surprised by this, uh, was a FNAF dark ride uh, where you would go to the amusement park and just like Snow White or, uh, or Sleep, not Sleeping Beauty, or Pinocchio or whatever at Disney World, where you hop in and you're kind of like carted through like a scary series of events or like an interesting narrative arc, there is a FNAF dark ride that was planned where I don't know the specifics of it, but you were in a, in a thing and you were carted through the pizzeria. Um, I believe and, and nothing ever came of it, or I guess people are assuming it's done. FNAF theme park ride. Let's see. Yeah. Sally's dark rides. Yep. This is it. Yep, 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 yep. And there was artwork for it and everything, right? So, oh, you're in a security car, kind of like Paul Blart Mole Cop on your Segway, riding through and you're being attacked. Yeah, and I think everyone was surprised that it had been, that the IP, that uh, Fazbear, had been uh, licensed out to this. Five Nights at Freddy's would literally be the greatest dark ride for our generation, says Patrick. Thanks, Patrick, from LinkedIn. Very insightful. <laughs> I like that that's the only quote. Random guy, randomly on LinkedIn. This, it feels like this should be a joke, but it isn't. I, I believe that this was shown at a real industry event. See, animatronics, look at this. Is this, is this real? These are terrifying. I'm sorry, cr cross-eyed critic. I saw this circulating. I don't know. I don't know if this is real. This has got to be real. I saw this a long time ago. And this would be a lot. This would be a lot for them to make. Yeah, this is real. This would be a lot for them to make up if this was not a real thing. Can you go back? Yeah, yeah, I'm going back. The animatronics. Oh, shoot, yeah. Scroll down. Yeah. Keep going. Uh-huh. Keep going. Uh -huh. Can you click on the monkey? This, this one right <laughs> yes. The orangutan? Yes. That's not a monkey. That's an orangutan, okay? Is it? That's a, that's a bonobo. Uh, oh, it's King Louis, right? This is this is either this is King Louis or a ripoff of King Louis. Well, it's an orangutan, Orang orangutan, orangutan. Yeah. yeah, which is from, oh, Port Port Ad Adventura Worlds Anchor Anchor Splash, huh? But no, I mean like this is very reminiscent of of Jungle Book. Yeah. Right. So I'm getting that too. Yeah, King Louis. Huh. Well, this was fun. This this is cool, man. 
But yeah, no, so I, I knew Sally Dark Ride. And this, yeah, this has to be real because this is so much. I just look at that list of things that they're like, here's our animatronics. I'm like, these look like they were just Google image searched and dropped into here. But no, this would be a lot for, for a fake thing. Uh, but yeah, no, I remember that there was artwork for each of these things. Like, here was, you know, this is 2016. And this was after the Vegas attraction, I believe. So they did the dark room slash, like, uh, haunted house experience in Vegas. I love this idea of a purple-clad security guard welcoming people into... It's, it's actually... I think it's brilliant. I think that it is the embodiment of what FNAF 3 is kind of meant to be, right? A Fazbear Frights-style attraction where you are going through the lore of this horror series and of the game. Like, I think I think it's brilliant. So it looks like you're starting your FNAF 1 and there's even, like, first night and 12 a.m. It, it's really cool and it seemed like a fully fleshed out idea. I don't... I guess people, like, they weren't able to sell it. I'm surprised that... I guess the movie rights are at Blumhouse now. But I'm surprised... I keep expecting it to show up at, like, a Universal Horror Nights. Um... Like, I don't see FNAF being a permanent attraction at any amusement park. Like, I don't see this being a permanent thing. But I absolutely see it being a horror maze that shows up at, like, a Knott's Berry Farm or a, like, a Six Flags Halloween weekend sort of thing. Or, like I said, Universal Studios uh, Horror Nights, Halloween horror, Hollywood Horror Nights. Like, I think it makes perfect sense because it's a different aesthetic. You have, like, the scares... I, I think it would it would crush. I think it would make so much sense. Um, I think it would do really, really well. Uh, also, this guy looks a lot like Ryan Reynolds. Doesn't he? Um, I'm not seeing it. Okay, great. Well, you, have you, do you know who Ryan Reynolds is? I know that he's not in the movies that you tend to watch. <laughs> I saw Deadpool. Great, okay. <laughs> Where Deadpool. his face was covered or, you know, heavily burned throughout most of it. Sure. Uh, and then Foxy jumps here. I mean, it makes it writes itself, right? I think this is cool. I think it's a cool idea. Interactive IP. Where a group of six security... Okay, so here's the story. Where a group of six security guards in charge of patrolling the Freddy Fazbear Pizza Restaurant during our shift, we find that we're being stalked by a number of deadly animatronics roaming the buildings. Uh, they're infused with the spirits of dead children. Uh, the remnant that has been infused uh, with their agony of their death has been uh, put into their endoskeletons, and it's our job to, you know... <laughs> It's our job to put to, to touch random uh, tiles on the wall in order to spell out happiest day, at which point then we set their spirits free, but then they come back, uh, and then two spirits possess one of the golden animatronics, which then releases, but one tortures the security guard. At the very... It's a very simple story. Like, you can convey this in a ride very easily. Um, <laughs> our mission is to defend ourselves. And maybe that's for, uh, for the FNAF 2 ride. Our mission is to defend ourselves against the animatronics and try to stay alive until 6 a.m. in the morning. Our only weapons are our flashlights, which scare the robots away, and buttons on the dash. Also, it's interactive, and buttons on the dashboard of the ride vehicle that give us the ability to shut doors. Very cool. We're always made aware of the risk of either running low on battery power in our flashlights or having to conserve power so we can operate the doors. Sometimes your team survives till morning. Sometimes they get you. I think that is great. I think that makes so much sense. Yeah, that's kind of genius. Right? Isn't it? And, and you can see how this isn't... Like, it wouldn't be hard to do. You've yeah. seen other rides doing this exact sort of thing, right? It's, it's like a, a Buzz Lightyear That's Astro Blaster. That's exactly what I was thinking about. Yeah. Mm. Pew, 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 you know, yeah. shine the light. It, and then, like, at the end, you're you're destined to run out of power. So right. So there's a big jump scare. Yeah, it, it ends the big finale mm -hmm. of, like, ah, oh, and then it's like, okay, and you're done. Yeah. Woo, you scoot away. And then you exit into daylight. Right, exactly. Yeah. I think it's great. I, I think it's brilliant. The fa And the, I, I would guess that the only reason this has not become a reality or has not sold or whatever is because no one knows what Five Nights at Freddy. Like, to us, we recognize that it's a huge franchise and anyone who invests in this is going to have that next generation of park goers being like, I want to go there for the Five Nights at Freddy's ride. I guarantee it would be a huge smash hit for those groups. But I think right now, the old powers that be who aren't internet savvy and don't engage on YouTube or internet culture are like, what is this game? Not realizing that, you know, it's made the creator $60 million or whatever. Meanwhile, the Jimmy Neutron ride at Carowinds is still alive and well. Right, ex yeah, no, exactly, <laughs> right? We're, yeah, they're green lighting, yeah, the Jimmy Neutron ride. Not or, that I don't love the Jimmy Neutron uh, ride, yeah, but it no is offense. still standing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas stuff like this, which is new and fresh, Fresh and like, oh, this is like relevant and cool. Yeah. Is oh yeah, I'm not. Why would I bother to do this? It's mm -hmm. like no, this is this is huge. If I had a theme park, I'd be all over this. Makes so much sense. 
I, uh, also rebranding a Chuck E. Cheese as a fine, like again, the fact that no one has done this stuff, is huge missed opportunities for people. I'm just saying, Chuck E. Cheese, get on that. Okay, uh, so we've gotten through three. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, let's uh, let's see. We can knock out some of these. Okay, uh, these will take a minute. Uh, sister location, mature version. I believe this was. Yes. So Scott likes to release troll games in advance of his real games. Obviously, Security Breach didn't do that, but back in the day, uh, Scott would release versions of his games slightly early, and all the internet would freak out and be like, oh my gosh, FNAF 2 just dropped, or like, oh my gosh, Security Breach just dropped. And it was, and I would get inundated with tweets being like, did you see Security Breach, Security Breach? And I believe Security, or sorry, Sister Location, when it first came out, the day before it was slated to come out, there was Security Breach, and then you loaded it, and it said Mature Version. And we're like, oh, they would, I, I think, here, I think, I think we actually have a GT Live clip of this. Security breach, mature, I think. Okay, thanks for not giving me anything. Oh, I said security breach. I keep saying security breach. Sister location, mature. Is this it? Is this, is this what you saw already? Or is no, this, this okay. is a new post. Okay, okay. so we'll, we'll read it. We'll read it just so everybody has it. <gasps> this is, oh um, man, look at yeah. baby map. location MA. MA, yeah. So hold on. So just to give you guys an update. Hold on. So you sent in what appears to be... Which we weren't aware of. The real version we so surprised. of... This took us all by... Location Mature Edition, I guess? Or like... I remember this. We were looking for what, you know, we're like, oh, we're going to do something today for our live stream, and then tomorrow will be Sister Location. And then all of a sudden, midday, we're getting all these tweets about like, oh my gosh, she dropped Security Breach, or Sister Location. Check it out. So I guess and then... he maybe is really concerned about it. So... We're going to, what are we going to do, Jason? I'm going to start the download. Okay, please. so this is the official release that Scott had. Yeah, this is the press release. Hey, guys, I wanted to let everyone know what I've decided, and it's just a warning. A lot of you aren't going to be happy about it, but please try to understand. Ever since I started making games, I wanted to be a world builder. I never wanted to make gimmicky games or things that didn't mean something. I wanted to create experiences that would really have an impact on people. I feel like I got to this do that so with cool. the first few games, but somehow I feel like I let myself get too dark with this one. Things went sideways, and I look at this game now, and I'm unsure of how it will affect people. At this time, at the same time, though, Maybe. people want a horror game, and I get that. I understand that. This is supposed to be a horror game and not kid-friendly. So then, what am I supposed to do? Release something that offends me just to satisfy so those concerned. who want oh. to play it? And if there's ever doubt about <laughs> us going into these things blind... <laughs> look at your face. I know, I was so confused. Like, this is, a, this is huge, man. This is huge. It was awesome. Like, this was so cool. This was such a cool moment in the history of the franchise. It was amazing. Because, cause, and, and, and like I said, if, if you ever doubt that we, like, play the games or whatever in advance, like, here you go. Cause or do I take the time and effort I would never. to really craft something that everyone can enjoy? And the answer is obvious to me. So this is legit. Okay. Like this came from Scott on Steam. Let's do it. This is from his official account, so here it is. I, I like Let's that we even threw up the mature stream yeah. thinking that's like, uh oh, we don't know what we're getting into. Yeah, Apparently. this might be a really mature stream. We just have no idea. So this is the mature version of Sister Location. The real version won't be coming out for another few months, so here it is. So cool, or so cool. They don't match up with Sister People who play, uh... The face. Shoot possessed animatronicness uh it's it's impressive like this and then and then it just became a troll shoot him do i have to headshot do i have to shoot fredbear in the face or can i shoot him anywhere that is the question yeah, so we were playing here we were yeah because we were playing a different game too and then we you click on it okay so then you get this yeah cool all right are you kidding me are you, are you effing kidding me? Oh, was it troll? <laughs> that was so mad! Oh, we got trolled. Are you kidding me? This is the equivalent of getting so... trolled on the internet. Are you kidding? <laughs> it was so good. It Damn was so it! Good. The chat <laughs> was, I, I, I was floored. Yeah, it's totally a troll. Lame. Yeah, it's it's sit and survive, which is Damn one it. of uh, Scott's Damn early it, games. Scott. But you and then we played it, and then we played it for the stream. Like that was it, and then we went back to like the the, the first person shooter game <laughs> that 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 had been released or whatever. So anyway, uh, yeah, that <laughs> that is Sister Location Mature Version, which was awesome, so fun, so fun. Um, Remory, I believe, is the first person to complete Ultimate Custom Night. 
uh, with a 5020, I believe. Uh, here, let me do, let me just double check that. Remory, yeah, FNAF, okay. Yes, Remory was the first one to beat uh, 5020 mode in FNAF Ultimate Custom Night. Shut up. Yep, 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 yep. So, uh, yes. So, uh, if you'll flash back to Ultimate Custom Night, there is a... This was a weird period in the history of the FNAF franchise where everyone was really into the competition about who would be the first person to beat this game with 50-20 mode. Like, this was at the height of, like, I am the king of Five Nights at Freddy's. Like, Markiplier's meme of, like, I am the king of this because I've beaten all these other games on their hardest modes had, like, escalated to a point where the fan base was really emotionally invested, or at least it seemed like, the fan base was really emotionally invested into who would be the first person to beat this game and truly take the crown of, like, the king of Five Nights at Freddy's. Um... Yes, Matt. I have a question. Yes. I'm raising my hand, but yes. no one can I, see it. No, of course. Um, Matt has raised his hand. Yes, Matt, you, um, you, you have been acknowledged on the floor. For those of us that um, lack a little FNAF, what is 5020? Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so since the beginning, uh, there have been uh, modes in these games that allow you to adjust the difficulty of the animatronics uh, at the end of kind of your gameplay experience. Uh, this is what has colloquially, 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 colloquially been known as either custom nights or nightmare nights or things like that. And uh, usually it rates from like level zero, they don't show up that night, to level 20, which is as high of difficulty as they get. Like they're going ham, right, on you. Mm -hmm. And um, so like in FNAF 1, uh, if you would, you could adjust the four main animatronics, right? Uh, and if you typed in 1987, bite of 86, 87, uh, so, uh, if you typed in 1987, you crash the game. Like there were, there, it's a fun way to like type in Easter eggs mm. and stuff like that. But ultimately at the end of the day, if you beat 420 mode, which mm. was four animatronics all set at 20 mm. in the beginning, you got like an extra star. Okay. And ever since then, there has been the like, the 20 mode, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's, in the first game it was 420, in the second game I believe it was 1020 mode. Mm. Uh, but all the animatronics set at max difficulty. Mm. That is like shorthand. Okay. And so Custom Night comes out and it is a game with 50 animatronics mm. all attacking you at once, right? It's crazy. This mm. game is crazy. Um, so much so that, I mean, this was before your time, but to play it, and we tested out everything to try and get as far into this game as possible, we had two keyboards set up Whoa. where, uh, like, there was, like, I was playing part of it with my feet because one of them just had you, like, have to, like, hit the letter F or whatever every yeah. time. Like, uh, when Old Man Consequences show up, you'd have to, like, hit, like, space or something. So, like, there was one that was easy to do with your foot. Um, but anyway, long story short, uh, it, it is shorthand for the most difficult version and ultimate custom night was like okay well here's 50 20 mm -hmm. how do you do this mm -hmm. right and scott's like this i think this is impossible you know i've had my my kids playing test this like i we can't get past like two i think this is impossible but the community's like it's excuse me it's not impossible whatever we're gonna do this and so it became a competition to see who and and markiplier whenever he would beat the hardest version up to that point, he was always like, I'm the king of Five Nights at Freddy's! Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, he had beaten the hardest mode and he had consistently been able to do that. Um, and for whatever reason, at this point in the series, everyone was really invested in who was going to be the first to do this and cl claim the crown or whatever. Um, and so you had Docco was one who was like going hours and hours, like, I mean, round the clock doing this thing, trying to, try, trying to churn it out. Um, and then you also had uh, DJ Sturf, and I think this is where the community first really became aware of DJ Sturf, uh, who is a wonderful guy and who, you know, has been on our St. Jude livestream in the past. He's, he's incredibly talented. He's been doing speed runs of Security Breach. I've been watching him because I think it's fascinating to watch him break the game and figure out all these hacks and stuff. Um, he's also one of the, like, tends to be one of the beta testers for the games before they actually come out because he's just very smart about the way he's looking at, like, picking apart the game. Um... But it, it became, like, really Docco versus DJ Sturf. And then I, I don't know where Remory fit into that. Uh, but the community was like, who's going to be? And, and they felt like, and, and they were starting to attack each other. And, like, it, it got kind of ugly in a way that I think everyone, after it all ended, take, took a step back. And they're like, hey, I think we got a little out of hand here. And, and again, forgive me if I'm speaking out of turn, but at least from an outsider's perspective who was looking and checking in on this every once in a while, that's what it seemed like the general consensus was to me. Um, 
but at at a I, I believe Remory came in first. I think then it was like DJ Sturf and Daco ended up I think working together to figure it out. And then at this point, and then this was also Doc, or this was also Markiplier being like, I'm not going to beat this game. Like, this is crazy for me to try and do. You know, there are other people who should be the king. Let's let's end the meme. And like, at this point, it's kind of like done, right? Um, so it was an interesting time. But uh, yeah, it, this was all about this like push to, to beat this almost like impossible mode. Uh, but then you beat it. And that's when you unlock the twitching Golden Freddy uh, you know, descending into the darkness because he refuses to pass on uh, and refuses to kind of let go of William Afton's soul. So it actually, it was one of those moments that actually revealed a, a big part of the lore. I think you you can actually reveal it at like maybe two degrees less difficulty than that, but at that point, like if <laughs> 50 animatronics set at 48 mode or whatever, that's stupid, so whatever. But uh, but anyway, so that's, that's the story behind that one. Um... Plushies take Manhattan. <sighs> this is... This is a failed concept of the FNAF movie. And I don't know if it was a joke or not. Uh, but last year... Last year, Scott gave an update as far as the FNAF movie. Which, I, I at this point, I don't think is ever going to happen. Uh, I think there's too much like creative challenges with that. I, I don't know. Who knows? Um, or, or if it does happen, it'll be long past when it should have happened. Uh, but Scott came out with a Reddit post that was like, hey guys, I've got news about the movie. Sorry. Um, and everyone's thinking like, oh, the movie's been canceled. Like we keep expecting it to be canceled. And then he goes through this list of here are all the different versions of the movie that I passed on. Like, I didn't want this to happen, I didn't want this to happen, I didn't want this to happen. I think one of them was Plushies Take Manhattan. And I don't know if it was a joke or not. It seems like it should be a joke. Uh, let's see if I can do this. Uh, Reddit, FNAF, movie, Reddit, Plushies, uh, Plushies, Plushies Take Man. Let's see. Uh, Bad news, this was it, if I remember right. Yeah, maybe? Yeah, post by Scott, okay. Uh, before I get to the bad news covering the State of Five Nights at Freddy's movie, uh, I wanted to share, he's such a troll. It's it, like, I, if anything, this episode has shown like how trolly he is, which is great. I mean, it, it's brilliant. It plays into the, the, the feelings of the audience, right? Where, bait and switch. So he says the bad news, but then the bad news is this is the last update you're gonna get. Oh, and onto the bad news. The bad news is that there won't be any more screenplays to add to this list because we're officially making the mic screenplay. So that, like that, ha, there's the twist. Um, but through this, right, and this is, I think this was a really cool one. Um, so he goes through all the list of the different scripts that he rejected from the studios, right? So the F screenplay, group of teenage troublemakers break into Freddy's, cast and suits. It's pretty basic, yeah, pretty basic setup. Uh, a lot of odd choices, which only got weirder as the story went on. Strands with our protagonist in a secret underground animatronic factory that was designing robots for the government. I like that he has this face, like this like tired face, like, you know, cringe emoji almost. But the thing is, it's not that far off. A secret underground animatronic factory. Hmm, sister location? What? Like, of course, don't judge that. That is entirely within the canon of your series. For the government, sure, I can get why that part is a little bit cringe, but like, I don't know. <laughs> it's not that bad. And also the basic setup of kids breaking into Freddy's and Chaos Ensues, that is literally the silver eyes. Like a bunch of kids who were traumatized by this franchise as, a, as children go back to it, revisit it, and like Chaos Ensues. <laughs> it's, that is the first book. It's not that far off. Yeah, here's Plushies Take Manhattan. Plushies Take Manhattan. Problem. Plushies took Manhattan, burned it with my... It's fair. Uh, in case you didn't know, these... This, I mean, this is a really cool post. I, I always thought that this was fun. I don't know how many of these are believable. I think they, for the most part, were. I, it almost prompted me to do a film theory about how maybe one of these got made into either the Banana Splits movie or uh, Wally's Wonderland. Um, I just didn't have enough evidence to support that, but I always want to make a film theory about this. Uh, the random Charlie screenplay, Charlie and her friends sneak into Freddy's after hours to retrieve a lost... Again, this is very much similar to the first novel, um, except for the lost toy bit. Although sharing names and familiar characters, the characters had nothing to do with the game of the book counterparts. Again, he says that like he's poo-pooing it. Spoiler alert, Scott, you've used the name Jeremy like 600 times in this franchise, so... 
using the same name in multiple iterations is not all that revolution. Like, that is what you have infused into the series. Uh, while featuring familiar elements, it seemed too loosely based on the games. See how... Sure, okay. Had lost a lot of impact because of it. Felt like a random bag of FNAF elements. Hmm. <laughs> Silver Eyes screenplay. All of these are the Silver Eyes. Uh, we worked on three versions of a Silver Eyes screenplay over the course of about a year, trying to find the right approach to the story from the first book. These were the first attempts that I made to write a screenplay, and then after realizing it's difficult to find someone who understands the lore. Hmm. <laughs> There's a lot that could be said about this post. Unfortunately, it also meant the screenplay has suffered from, you know, it is hard to write a screenplay. Um, there you go. So focus on the screenplay from the games and not from the books. So this is, I think, an important quote that if a movie ever does happen, I will probably come back to cite because I think this is... I ultimately decided to focus on making the screenplay from the games, not the books. And then people will be like, but it's a movie. It's a different... They're connected. They're all inspiring each other. The pawn shop. This was an interesting one, I thought. A kid who watches over a pawn shop finds trouble when an animatronic is brought in. Uh, it turns out Freddy's has been robbed, and the animatronics are taken to different locations for sale. The other animatronics come to retrieve the one at the pawn shop, and the kid and his friend get roped into the adventure. Uh, it's creative, but yeah, it's a boy and his animatronic. It's an after-school adventure, which I think is cute. Seems like a Fazbear Fright. Cassidy screenplay. So, and this is, so this was the first time that Scott officially confirmed, like, officially confirmed that Cassidy is the name of at least one of the victims in the series. Uh, we, up to this point, we had guessed it, we had proven it through a couple different routes, but this was the first time that it was actually acknowledged. Diving deep, this screenplay packed in a lot of lore following the story of Cassidy. Multiple time periods, multiple characters, featuring lore from multiple games. This was pretty saturated. Uh, it may have been satisfying to the most hardcore fans, but it would have left the majority of people confused and lost. Hey, wait, maybe this was the most accurate screenplay. See, I appreciate that, because he recognizes that it's all, it's all jokes at its expense. Uh, it's a visual encyclopedia than a movie, which honestly, I think everyone would be eager to have at this point. Please give us an encyclopedia of this stuff. Um, it would, I would be, I would buy all the tickets. Wasn't unsatisfying, it wasn't satisfying even to me. I, it would be satisfying to me. Misfit Kid, single mom brings her kid to a new town, finds Freddy, hilarity. Um, I think this is interesting. One of the problems in creating modern day stories with Freddy's, old Freddy's locations is finding ways to connect the protagonist to the restaurant. I think that's an interesting storytelling challenge um hmm. and it's interesting to think about this because i mean maybe this is the reason why if we're right about gregory being robot kid which again i i have no emotional stake in that game it's just the it is just the angle that seems to be the most accurate but i think one of the interesting things about that is maybe that's why they decided potentially to make gregory robot kid of crying child because it connects him back to the old franchise of games even though it's Freddy's for a new generation. I don't think you need that in to tell a story about this franchise. I think the legacy of Freddy's continuing forward and moving on and, and just being a, a pop culture thing, I think it's strong enough at this point in the lore of the series that like anyone can connect to it. And we've shown that Freddy's can reboot multiple times or under multiple names at this point. So the idea that like you have to connect someone back to the original restaurants I don't think you have to do that to tell a good story in this franchise. And I, th I think hopefully, you know, based on kind of everyone being like, hey, why are we still talking about the Aftons here in Security Breach? I hope that, you know, games moving forward or whoever's working on these moving forward kind of learns that lesson that you don't need to do that. It's okay. Um, there are still ways to, like, tie it back to the old lore, but start telling new stories. Uh, okay, finding a reason to stay. The problem is that... The reason, okay, misadventures. Yeah, it felt forced. Ghost tractors, they go... They search for ghosts in Freddy's. The insane screenplay, another ghost tracker variation, but with the fun times. Underground ball pit tunnels. Do they travel you through time, though? That's the question. And a marionette out for the wrench. The mic screenplay. And then this is ultimately what he goes with. Uh, basic setup. This makes sense. Why didn't I think of this before? This is a good mix. It has the best pieces from all the previous screenplays. Not really any problems. The right characters, the right motivations, the right stakes. We're, we got this one. So it's telling the story of Mike, right? Um, which honestly seems like it's been the story of the games. You know, this is one that we pitched a while ago when we solved FNAF for like the third time. Uh, where it's like, oh, it's the story of Mike going to all these different pizzerias and trying to atone for the sins of his like father's past and his past actions. Um... But yeah, so anyway, if, if a movie ever happens, 
presumably it is the story of Mike. So that is the unused, uh, that is the unused uh, plushies take Manhattan and all the subsequent, uh, all the subsequent uh, screenplays. FNAF in real life. Uh, let's let's burn through these because I know at this point we're probably already over time, right, Matt? Uh, yeah. Okay, great, cool. Uh, real quick, let's just get through this chunk. <laughs> we'll save the other. Ah, we're gonna hit fifteen, Matt. We're gonna hit fifteen. These were interesting ones, though. To be fair, these were really interesting ones. That it wasn't just like, oh, it's a screenshot or whatever. Like this is actually there's a lot of other stuff connected to all of these. Um, FNAF in real life is kind of the trend that you've seen. Uh, especially on Twitter or on Reddit where people find like, you know, old photos of pizzerias or like Chuck E. Cheese's or they pull old um, operation guides of animatronics or they create their own. I'm thinking that that's what this is. FNAF in real life, this idea of taking the concept of these games and translating them to real life circumstances. Uh, they've manufactured newspaper stories about it. They've manufactured... Uh, headlines, they've manufactured animatronic guides, creepy photos of people with like old school animatronics. Uh, I think that, that that's that what that one's talking about. Spring trap posters. Uh, I'm thinking that this is uh, FNAF. I think this is the just there were a couple of random yeah I, I figured this would give us a bunch of merch. Um, I think these were just Easter eggs. In FNAF 3? Freddy knows. No, I don't want day Dying Light 2. Stay human. No, thank you. Pass. I, I don't know. I've, I have no idea. Uh, sometimes the posters in Freddy's will be replaced with posters of Spring Bonnie. Yes. So I believe that these are references to the uh, images where you see different versions of Springtrap ripping open his head. Um, similar to like the posters that would show up of Golden Freddy in FNAF 1, all the games have like posters that like randomly appear on the walls. And I think this one was where you started to see Springtrap pulling open his head and you could see like the skull underneath and it was like, hey, there's a human body in there. Again, this was way back before people actually knew that it was possessed and that William Afton's inside. And this is, so that was a big moment of, hey, there's something inside the animatronic that's still alive. And look, there's like flesh and tendons and stuff in there. That's weird. Um, so I think that that's what that's a reference to. Hidden Biddy Babs and Mini Renas and Reversed Bibs. Uh, I think this is, I don't know, Reversed Bibs FNAF. Not, I don't know, in the, Chica, okay. In the FNAF World trailer, Chica's bib is backwards. Okay, so, <laughs> there it is. See, some you gotta talk about. Some are this. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but but here it is, friends. What is the lore implications of a reverse chica? Could it be a mirror world? Is is FNAF world actually taking place in the upside down where everything is the left is right and the right is left? You don't know. Maybe it is. Boom! Blown my mind. Uh, and then lastly, so I'm assuming that there's a couple instances of that throughout the games uh, or throughout promotional material. And then lastly is hidden bitty babs and mini arenas. Hidden. Biddy, Biddy, Babs. I hate that name. And Mini. I'm assuming this is another one that. What happened to the. What happened to the Biddy Babs and Mini Rings? Or this is just the lore. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> yeah. Well, I believe I have an answer. This is the location of the Mystery Easter Egg, Biddy Babs. Hmm. Sometimes on the left side of Mini Arena. Now, what do I bring these up? Because they, well, they escaped. Okay. Uh, it is a good question. I've never really given these guys much thought. Honestly, William's purpose for making Bitty Babs and Mini Arenas probably should think about that at some point. Put that on my list of, like, FNAF angles that I have not covered in 200 years. Um, where do they go? I'm, I'm assuming this just... Yeah, hi, I'm peeking out over here. Hello. Uh, trivia. Probably under trivia. Bitty Babs and Circus Baby or Snow White and Seven Dwarfs. Bitty Babs is one of the only animatronics, not of Rosa Cheeks. Let me brighten up the teaser. Bitty Bab has five fingers. Only I'm trying to have my face. Okay. Ah, bah, 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 bah. Although seven. Okay, this is. This must be it. Although seven Bitty Babs were shown in their teaser, only two appear in the game and in the extras menu. Okay. I guess that's it. Voices change. There are only two. There are only two Bitty Babs in Baby's poster, meaning that there's a chance to that there are two, not seven. Okay. I'm assuming that this is it. 
yeah. This is, they're one of those ones that I've never been the biggest fans of as far as their inclusion. But also, here's the thing, right? It shows that William Afton is getting closer to making humanoid animatronics. Like, if you, if you look at him, if you look at Baby, if you look at whatever, again, if Gregory is a robot, again, I, I have no emotional stake in that game. I'm just calling it like I sees it and just trying to connect dots into some cohesive narrative. Um, you know, if it shows progressively that they were building robots that were trying to get more and more human-like, and so they're a step in that process, right? There it is. Uh, so there you have it, friends. That is another rung of our little iceberg complete. Only one, two, three, four, five more to go. At this rate, we're going to hit 15. No, next time we're going to get through all of these. At least these, I'm committed. Next time we're getting through Foxy and Faceless Bonnie, all right? Um, there you go. So, did you learn something, Matt? What you learned today? I like I like wrapping off these FNAF icebergs with stuff that you learned. What did you learn today? Um, I, I learned about the theme park, which is really cool right i think so too glad to have learned that also the the screenplay post is is a very cool post right isn't that a cool post yeah i that was one of those where it was like really like behind the scenes mm -hmm. stuff because the, the fnaf movie has bounced back and forth so many times and changed hands and there's been so many canceled and people who left the project and this and that and you're like why but this shows you yeah, why because the movie is hard it's hard because mm -hmm. because not only do you have to like make a movie, which in and of itself is hard, yeah. but you also have to get people to be comfortable giving you money to make that movie. Mm -hmm. And a lot of time those people are going to be like, yeah. I, I mean, it goes it goes to the, the amusement park ride where like yeah. the people presumably that Scott's dealing with when it comes to getting his movie made mm -hmm. are people who are like, yeah, but can't they just be like Freddy versus Jason or, you know, yeah. like they're, they're the people who are like, just, just the animatronics kill people. Like what the heck? Mm -hmm. And Scott's like, no, there's lore here and people are going to like, care about it and there's easter eggs and there's an actual story and they're like yeah but why yeah yeah, yeah and, and and i think that's probably one of the big problems that mm -hmm. the movie has had is this disconnect of like here's a diehard fan base and scott representing it and the movie studio who's like just cheaply pump out a film mm -hmm. you know and i and i think that's probably the drama there but anyway so there you have it friends uh that is a little one rung deeper on the iceberg <laughs> So let me know if I missed anything. Let me know if you have any thoughts on any of this. What movie would you like to see? Obviously, Plushies Take Manhattan was the, the correct option there. Uh, but uh, we will see you in the next video. So thank you guys so much for watching. Remember, it wasn't a live stream, but it will be live on February 19th. So be there. Uh, we'll tell you the time as soon as we know it. And as always, remember, uh, well, I was already wrapping it up with it wasn't a live stream. But anyway, it was a video. Thanks for watching. See ya!